Hi, welcome to Integrative Preparedness. I'm Steve Smith. Well, it is December 31st, 2020. Coming up on New Year's Eve, a new year tomorrow. It's been a heck of a year and uh, promises to be another heck of a year ahead of us. We all know kind of what's uh, what's in front of us over the next month or so. Certain, certain decisions are going to be made. Certain things are going to happen that will determine what direction, what fork of the road we're taking here. Um, <clears throat> if, uh, if we have one outcome, there's going to be concerted and continual assaults on our constitutional rights. <clears throat> if, uh, if it goes another way, uh, it won't be that same, but there will be, uh, civil unrest to the extent that I imagine there's going to be responses that will <clears throat> necessitate, necessitate uh, um, some restrictions, shall we say, on, uh, on our daily lives. Who knows? These things could go anyway, and, and uh, nobody has a crystal ball to be able to say exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but I think that it's safe to say that it's going to be interesting times. Um, we very possibly could be living under an oppression that is much greater than we're even living under now. And... Uh, <laughs> And I know a lot of people think that we're under uh, oppression right now, and, and, and I will understand that. I, I, I won't argue against that. But true oppression is far worse than what we're experiencing in our country at this moment. But it could get there, and it could get there in a hurry. I want to talk about a group <clears throat> that has perfected the art of living under oppression and uh, and from whom we can get some great lessons. Um, and that's the Irish. The Irish Republicans in the north of Ireland, what most people refer to as Northern Ireland. Um, to begin at the beginning would take far too long. It goes back 800 years. Uh, 800 years of oppression by, by Great Britain. Um, but I won't do that. What I want to just talk about is today. If you want more information on the situation in in Ireland, I do suggest go back. There, there's plenty out there. And, and I've had people ask me for reading lists, and, and it, it, it would just be so long. There are plenty of, plenty of books. Just, just, uh, just look up the troubles and, uh, and trace it back to to the history of Ireland, going clear back to the statutes of Kilkenny, and even before that, the, the British plantation into the northern province of Ulster. I used to give speeches on this at colleges, and it took me an hour just to scratch the surface, so I won't drag you through all that because I want to get back to today. There are, um, there are people with whom I am personally familiar who uh, live under oppression is not as bad today as it was uh, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, but it's still not, you would still not call their situation equal in, uh, in the north of Ireland or northern Ireland. Um, to, to let you know just kind of the extent to which this oppression uh, reaches I was uh, I was almost uh, thrown in jail one night in Belfast, Northern Ireland, for taking a picture of a police car. Now, you may be aware that they have tried to pass laws like that here, and in some cases you can be arrested uh, for taking pictures of certain government installations and things like that. And people people can pass that off about, well, that's reasonable, you know, and that's national security. But but just realize, go back and, and ask yourself, uh, why would it be illegal for a citizen to take a picture of anything in their country uh, that their tax money paid for? Okay, now back to this. <clears throat> the Irish, the, the indigenous, the... the uh, the Catholic 
Irish, essentially, the Republicans, those who want Ireland to be a republic, a unified republic, as opposed to being partitioned with part of the island still being controlled by Great Britain. Uh, they have been persecuted for years and years and years, persecuted uh, the way that uh, uh, blacks were persecuted here in the United States for so long. And most people don't know anything about this uh, because uh, of the way that it's been, been portrayed in the media. Uh, those who resisted that persecution were simply labeled as terrorists. Uh, the fact of the matter is they were simply people who didn't want to be persecuted, who didn't want their families to be kept living in public housing, which they call estates, uh, who, who wanted to be able to get good jobs like everybody else, who wanted representation in government, who essentially wanted equal rights. And, uh, and there were a number of, uh, of demonstrations during the, the 60s and 70s and 80s to, to try to attain that. And, and you may be or may not be, if you're not, go ahead and look it up. You may be familiar with the uh, the hunger strikers led by Bobby Sands. Look that up. Look up the blanket men. Uh, look up uh, Bloody Sunday, which uh, which occurred in, in Derry in the bog side. Um, as a matter of fact, I happened to, to go through the Bloody Sunday um, museum over there um, the week before it officially opened because of of uh, a group I was with, <clears throat> and it, it, it is fascinating study. It is the, the story of the oppression of a certain group of people within a country because of their beliefs, because of their political stance, because they stood against the oppression of the government. We see the reflection there, don't we? The, the Irish Republicans, and again, that, that means those who, who want Ireland to be a unified republic, uh, are represented by a number of different groups. Uh, most people recognize or may be familiar with or may have heard of the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. Uh, there, there's not one. There, there are several factions of them. Uh, there have been different split-offs because even within those groups, they have some differences of opinion as exactly how uh, how things should be done. The, the, the extent to which uh, paramilitary operations ought to be conducted in order to, you know, remedy um, certain situations. Uh, so there, there's those and as the INLA, uh, Irish National Liberation, uh, I forget what it is, agents, whatever it is. Association, maybe? I forget. I knew some of the guys in it, uh, but I don't remember exactly what that, because for the most part, it was IRA. Uh, they fought a paramilitary campaign against the British government for years and years and years. And actually, it goes back to the, to the partition uh, and, and back to the Irish Rebellion. The IRA was preceded by the Irish Republican Brotherhood. Uh, but anyway, study that on your own. And there are a lot of great lessons there. The lessons here is that they essentially fought the British government and the British military and the British police, which were a militarized police in Northern Ireland, uh, to a standstill. Uh, these people who were simply committed patriots for, for their side, and there's another side to this. There, there, were, there were another group, uh, other paramilitary groups on the loyalist side, mostly Protestant, but it wasn't all Catholic and Protestant because there, there were Protestants in, in the Republican movement, very active and very important in there. But people tried to, and the government especially, tried to make this a sectarian uh, uh, problem because that's the easiest way to get people to hate each other is use religion or race, right? And then the government has to come in and act like the savior when they implement uh, oppressive security measures. Um, well, anyway, they, uh, they, they fought that government to a, a, a standstill. Uh, all the might of the British military uh, was sent into Northern Ireland, uh, including the SAS, and they were were fought off and kept at bay uh, by committed partisans, patriots, uh, who had day jobs, you know, who were plasterers and masons and uh, carpenters 
and worked at community centers and bartenders and things like this. A community, a community of committed people, loyal to each other, committed to their cause, fought off the might of the British government, and, and pretty much brought things around uh, to, to win politically in the end. Now, they wouldn't have won politically if they hadn't been able to bring force against the force of the British government. Uh, but they were able to. And for the most part, and, and those of you who aren't familiar with this, uh, have probably heard about, you know, IRA terrorism and things like this. For the most part, the, the, their, their targets were military, were police, those, those instruments of the oppression themselves, uh, or economic, economic targets. Uh, there were, during the Troubles, uh, innocent people killed by both sides, by Republicans and by Loyalists. And both sides, I, 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 I know that the Republicans have I, I imagine the Loyalists have. I, I don't know that to be a fact because I, I was never in contact with any of them, but, but I imagine they have too, expressed uh, their, their sorrow and their apologies and accepted blame for those, uh, those innocent deaths that they all know and, and admit were unacceptable. These things happen, okay? These things happen in war. They happen on city streets. Uh, all the time, you know, here in Kansas City, there is always some kid being shot in the head because some idiot is driving by spraying the house. So, uh, so these these things do happen. Uh, the reason that the Irish Republicans were able to hold off the oppression, the the uh, oppressive attempts at oppression by the British government. Um, with, with all of the security apparatus that, that Great Britain had to bring um, was because of, like I say, their, their loyalty and their commitment, their belief in what they were doing, their belief in their stance. And that common belief came together because of the oppression under which they lived for so long. It became simply a matter of course. Every every Irish Republican male knew that probably he was going to be going to prison at some point in his life, and maybe sometimes multiple times. Uh, there's a story of a family of guys that I, I know. Uh, it's kind of a funny story. Um, a couple of them were being thrown in prison. Uh, one of them was a bank robber, or a train robber, actually. But... Uh, one was being uh, processed, uh, two of them went in together, and they were being processed into prison. And the guard who was processing looked at them, looked at their names, and says, my gosh, I won't, I won't use the guy's real names, I'll call him Murphy. Uh, he says, my gosh, so uh, Murphy and Murphy, uh, we, we, we already got your three brothers in here, you know, and, and I forget what else they said he said. And, uh, and they said, yeah, and two more are trying to get in here. It, it was just a way of life that they knew they were going to resist. They knew that they were under the, the security microscope. They knew that that the, the chances that they took uh, during their paramilitary operations uh, were, were important. They believed in them. They knew that they were taking a chance of going inside behind the wire, as, as they say. Um, there's a song about that. And, uh, and they knew that was a part of it, and they believed in it so much. And, and when uh, somebody was the prisoners, because they were considered political prisoners, uh, the prisoners were held up in great esteem by the entire Republican community. And, and the ones on the other side, the loyalist sides, were too. They were held up as, uh, as heroes, as their, their families were taken care of. Uh, they, they, when they came out, they were welcomed right back into the community with their, you know, their, their same positions and all that. And when they were in, in prison, in the cash, uh, that, that stands for long cash, which was what the Republicans called the, uh, the prison there, and the, the British called it the maze. It's closed down now. I think they've made it into a museum. Uh, 
<clears throat> but uh, when they went in there, they, they essentially uh, ran the, the the prison like so many prisoners did. <clears throat> but while they were in there, they they explained to me, they uh, it's not that they became friends with the loyalists. But they realized that the true enemy was the British government, who was setting the different sides against each other. And so while they were inside, the, uh, the IRA and the, the UDA, Ulster Defense Association, or UVF, Ulster Volunteer Force, uh, they worked together. You know, they, they were, what was the point of being in there and killing each other all the time when they finally realized that the, the, although they had many differences, the true enemy was the British government who was pitching them against each other. And we see a lot of that here. Um, so the reason that they were able to be uh, successful in this was, as I said, their, their commitment, their loyalty to each other, loyalty to each other, and the fact that the loyalty went so deep that the British could never get a snitch out of them. Now, I think there was a couple that did, but they got taken care of really quick. And it wasn't necessarily the threat of torture or death that kept people from snitching. It was the fact that to be an informant was anathema to, to them, an anathema meaning like something so questionable, so horrible, you know, with almost a, a, a religious, a moral implication there. Disgusting. Uh, that's what kept them, because if, if somebody was snitched, they, they, they were outside of accepted community for the rest of their lives, as could be their families, depending on the extent to which it went. Uh, and probably they'd be, they'd be kept pretty quick anyway. Uh, but they, these people ended up living very good lives. Now, the question is how they could live very good lives. And how, how, first off, how were they able to hold off the might of the British military? Well, they fought high tech with low tech. Okay. You don't talk on your phone. You talk in somebody's ear. Okay. You, everybody understood exactly what was being said even when the words themselves weren't being used. The British could not get inside that group. Okay. Now, and, uh, and, and they kept up. They kept up their normal lives. Okay. They kept up their normal lives while living in the cities and the towns uh, that the British were controlling. And you go through there, and I mean, there would be roadblocks all over the place, and, and British... You know, you're trying to go through a roadblock, and, and uh, here's some British Saracens, which is some of their armored vehicles, and, uh, and a squad of, uh, of their soldiers or their paras or their SAS, you know, pointing guns at you while you're, you know, just going down, trying to go to the market. Uh, and, and they were, that's what they lived under. But they did, they developed the ability to do it so well that, Ooh, if it looks like I changed position just a little bit, it's because the camera shut off. I ran out of storage space and had to cry for help and ask my oldest to come down and show me how to empty the trash. Uh, anyway, so what I, I was just explaining, the kind of oppression that, that they lived under uh, and, and they learned to live under very well. Uh, uh, you know, being harassed all the time, having their doors kicked in and... and, and uh, and sledgehammered open in the middle of the night. Uh, I was over at, at uh, somebody's house. I remember uh, a woman telling me, and it was, it was the same family that I told you about, uh, the brothers going into the cash. And uh, and the, the Brits were always going in there after one of them or, or another or something else, always looking for stuff, contraband, right? Well, you know, hey, uh, if you are a resistive organization under oppression, uh, you're going to have contraband. They were very good at that. Um, a skill that I encourage everyone to develop. Uh, but uh, the, the the mother said, and we were all sitting around in their, their living room, very small living room with probably 20 people there. And she, she said, she said, yeah, they came in here all the time. They broke that door down so many times we didn't even fix it for real. 
or just propped it back up. But they never took anything out of here except my sons. Now, they took the sons out. There's, 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 that's, that's kind of a sad statement, isn't it? But, but they never found anything in there except the guys. And then they took them. But these people learned to live with this. They, they lived under this. Now, they didn't intend to live like this forever because their daily activities and their efforts were all uh, meant to bring this to a conclusion in their favor. And it eventually pretty much did. But even through all of that, they lived, you wouldn't call it normal lives, but they, they reached a normality in which they were able to live good lives. You know, they had... They had their parties. They had their birthdays. Their families were extremely tight. Uh, they had their work. They had their community activities. Their world went on. And they were able to carve out certain areas in their strongholds that even the British wouldn't come in. You know, it's, it's, maybe I'll show you some pictures of that sometimes or look up the, the peace wall in, uh, in Belfast. Um, anyway, the lessons of living under oppression are lessons that I would encourage everyone to develop. Now, not everybody is going to be a soldier. Uh, not everyone is going to be in the intelligence branch. Not everyone is going to be uh, known. But if the entire community is not solidified in the cause, the resistance and the movement will not work. Now, this is why I doubt that any um, resistance here at this time will be effective. I, I really do. I know there are a lot of people out there saying that uh, uh, they're, 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 you know, the old cold dead hands thing. I know that. Well, it's it's easy to say when you're not under it. Now, I'm not calling anybody out. I'm not saying that anybody doesn't mean what they're saying. What I'm saying is that the oppression that we, you know, think that we've been under now is not to the extent that brings on the kind of continuity and loyalty that is needed for a true resistance to oppression. And I don't think that it will be for a while. Um, if it gets to that point, it's really going to be, uh, it's going to be horrendous. Um, and then a very small portion of our population will, uh, will rise to the occasion, in my opinion. Okay. We're just too fragmented. We're too, uh, for the most part, uh, Americans are too soft. They are not dedicated to much of anything. Um, They've lived easy lives and uh, great strength um, comes from working against great resistance. Thereby, thereby, I'm using that resistance in another way. You know, you don't get stronger without lifting heavy things. And there hadn't been any, any really heavy things to lift for a long time. And just uh, posturing tough doesn't... Uh, doesn't make tough, right? So anyway, I think that my, my advice here is that uh, as things progress, look at historical groups who have lived under true oppression. Learn from them. Uh, prepare. Be quiet. Keep your own counsel and keep the council within a very, very select, very loyal, and I mean to the point that you know they are, not that you hope they are or think they are. You know that they are loyal, that they won't break down. Because the weak, weak link is the one that, that puts you away. Uh, so study these groups, and we will see what's coming. But right now is a good time to practice and I suggest 
uh, being smart, not being loud, being thoughtful, not being vocal, um, and get ready. Okay? I'll leave it there. This is going to be a Patreon for a while. I don't know if I'll ever put this over on YouTube. We'll see. But you all have a good day. Remember that we prepare well today in order to live well tomorrow. And right now, I think one of the most important things you can do to prepare is to learn the ways of those who have lived under oppression and come out the other end successful because nobody wants to live under oppression forever. Sometimes you just have to until the day comes when you win. Okay. You all have a good day. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.